Welcome to uh, all of you. My name is uh, Eduard van Haas. I am a market intelligence program manager at CBI, and I will be uh, your host for today's uh, webinar on the effects of the Green Deal in EU rules and regulations in home decoration and home textiles. A few uh, general and um, practical remarks uh, to start with. Um, please note that uh, we cannot uh, hear or see you. You still, though, have uh, the possibility to interact with us throughout the questions tab, and we will consult um, these questions and answer a selection of them. We'll also be able to uh, look back and share this webinar as it will be published shortly on our uh, website. Please also uh, complete our short survey at the end of the webinar in order for us um, to gather your feedback on this session. And uh, lastly, if you have uh, any uh, audio or technical problems during this session, we advise uh, you to switch the, to the phone call uh, modus to solve the problem. The main topic of today um, will be the European requirements and regulations in home decoration and home textiles. And I would like to give a, a warm welcome to our presenters of today, which I will present to you briefly. So, Kees Bronk, uh, an independent export consultant in EU home decoration and home textiles. He is a, a former fair trade importer wholesaler and um, today a coach, trainer and matchmaker in the home decoration sector. He will uh, present and, and exchange views with Remco Kemper. He's a, an international product development and business consultant in EU home decoration. And he's also entrepreneur and owner of uh, Coca Bag, the first practical uh, mobility bag. And finally, we are very ha happy to uh, welcome our guest speaker, Christina Boschi. She is a, a scoring partner of the Carbon Disclosure Project as well as a technical advisor of the EPS Advisory Council. And uh, she was an expert jury member of the Ambiente Ethical Style Gal Jury for uh, sustainable consumer goods. Going through today's uh, agenda, um, we will start with uh, a short introduction of uh, CBI and then move on to our experts with a conversation and exchange of views on the EU Green Deal and its uh, consequences for home decoration. They will also go through the, the current and future evolution of um, EU regulations and relevant certifications. And um, in one hour, um, we will then give you a series of concrete tips and practical recommendations for you as an exporter. And the last 15 minutes of the session, we, We'll also give uh, um, the possibility to uh, go through our, your questions, and we expect to finish in one and a half hour. Starting with the short presentation of our organization, CBI uh, stands for Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. We are part of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, and our work is uh, funded and commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. CBI was uh, actually established um, during the 1970s. So we have now more than uh, 50 years of experience in contributing to local sustainable economic development through exports. We mainly uh, focus ourselves on SMEs from more than uh, 70 different countries throughout the years. And um, yeah, we build a sustainable trade relation with uh, European buyers. We also contribute directly to several sustainable development goals, such as uh, decent work, economic growth. We, pay, uh, we also pay special attention to women and youth in SMEs. We stimulate uh, sustainable production and trade, and we encourage partnerships for the goals. Looking at our uh, geographical reach, as you can see, we mainly focus ourselves on regions such as the Middle East and North parts of Africa, Sahel, West Africa, as well as on projects in specific Asian countries, mainly in, in Southeast Asia. And today, of course, Indonesia is our main focus. So um, that will be for this session. We cover 13 specific sectors based on uh, dynamic and promising fields and industries. 
from fresh fruits uh, and vegetables to tourism, from apparel to outsourcing. Um, but the most relevant for you, of course, are home decoration and home textiles. Our projects relies on several support solutions for SMEs and business support organizations, such as uh, helping, for instance, you to exhibit at leading uh, European trade fairs, but also uh, through our export coaching uh, programs with individual training, coaching, and market entry uh, activities on different uh, levels, like marketing, for instance, but also export development. And you'll see uh, on the right side of your screen a few examples of uh, current four-year export projects in, in the home decoration and home textiles. So, for instance, uh, we did a, an export coaching project on home decoration in, in, in Indonesia for you guys, but also uh, in Bangladesh, um, in Laos, and in Cambodia. We work with uh, a large base of uh, partners. Um, our focus groups are, of course, SME exporters, but uh, we also work with uh, government and, and sector organizations, NGOs, international organizations, and more locally with uh, European importers and European buyers. Our main resource is clearly uh, market intelligence with easy access and uh, free of charge studies on our website. So we're trying to, to give you the most practical answers to uh, questions like, for instance, uh, which countries offer the most opportunities in Europe for products or service? What channels should you use to enter the market in your sector? And what EU requirements must you follow? On the right side of your screen, you'll see the main page of our home decoration and home textiles. And, and you'll see that we have a selection of sector studies. We have tips to find buyers, tips to do business, tips to do digital, but also um, products, fact sheets that you can find related to your activity. To finish the general introduction uh, of CBI, please uh, keep in mind that you also have access to our social media canals like LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, I'm now very pleased to, uh, to leave the floor to our presenters of today, Remco and Kees, and our guest speaker, Christina Bushes. Okie dokie. Thank you so much, Edouard. And this is Kees speaking to you. Um, Remco and Christina, can you also unmute and show your face on camera? We're here. Hello. Yeah. Okay, hi Christina, hi Remco. Okay, so yes, today is about EU requirements uh, in, for you Indonesians in home decoration and home textiles. We are Christina, Remco and Case. Um, and we'll also, we've been introduced already, so that helps a lot, uh, but we'll do a quick one for you. Um, Remco, who am I? Well, Case, you're my esteemed colleague, and um, it's a good thing you're taking the lead in this webinar for the Indonesian participants because you've been working for CBI for a long time also in Indonesia. Currently you're working in Cambodia as a coach in the business export coaching program over there and you actually have a background in fair trade. Um, you've been working for them for a long time and you used to be Mr. Africa eh, in the fair trade organization. So you go back in more than 30 years I think in this uh, in this sector of home decoration and home textiles. Oopsie, yeah, I'm getting old, eh? Okay, you get Remco, it. thank you so much. Uh, also, um, not an old-timer, but he has a, also a long history in this sector. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, uh, a designer, I always feel, and a business consultant, just like me, for CBI. Currently, you are working in Bangladesh, in the coaching program there. Um, and together, we are doing market intelligence for CBI. Yeah? So, we are writing a lot of this. Um, documentation that uh, you will find on this uh, website by CBI in Market Intelligence. And you have Quokka Bag. What is Quokka Bag? Well, Quokka Bag is actually an accessory brand for wheelchair users. Uh, and um, basically, we've developed a system which allows people to have all kinds of accessories on their wheelchair, safely and securely locked away at a place where they can reach them. So right. uh, it's basically promoting inclusivity. How interesting is that, hey? So people should also check your website. Okay, then we Thank have a, a very dear colleague of mine, Christina, um, that we, we know each other from the Ethical Style Guide jury of Messe Frankfurt. Um, Christina, can you do your own introduction? 
Yeah, happy. Thank um, first of all for this invitation and that I can join those two um, experts here. I'm coming um, from DECRA, which uh, might be known to you as a testing certification and expert organization, so a bit of a different background. And personally, I'm a sustainability expert. I've been working in that field for over 15 years, focusing on product sustainability, uh, so the entire life cycle thinking, but also on the um, ESG disclosure, so how can companies com communicate about what they're doing and how to implement those in their processes. Um, and yeah, today I'm happy to also give you some insights from the European and legislatory perspective. Cool. Okay. Uh, Christina, for, to me, a little bit wobbly in the connection. So um, okay. that means uh, try to really slow down because otherwise mm -hmm. you might lose you. But that's just me. Maybe um, other people are hearing you well. Yeah, Christina, I'm very honored to have you here, really. Uh, Remco and me have worked together quite long. And uh, as you now know from her introduction, uh, she's got this like huge head full of all this green deal and legislation um, stuff so wonderful to have you thank you for joining us cool so what are we going to discuss today um, first of all legal requirements for your products so we've really looked at your um, offers and uh, we're going to kind of talk as specifically as we can about the real legal requirements related to your products then we're going to look at relevant certifications um, also, again, for your product offer. And then finally, we're going to look at the EU Green Deal, this big thing that seems to be coming uh, and hovering over us. And we're going to introduce a few main issues uh, related um, to the Green Deal and related to you also. So that's the third aspect. And then we're going to summarize and give you tips as much as possible. Now, this is very much your show. Um, the way we, we are going to do this is really invite you to talk along with us. Um, as Edouard already said, there's this um, question box for all of you. So uh, type your questions, remarks, shout boo or whatever you want. Um, just interact with us uh, and Remco will make sure that a selection of your questions pops in uh, into our presentation so that you you don't feel frustrated of not being heard or not being so specific enough. Eh? So join us. Um, this is a really open conversation between us and you. Okie dokie. First, legal requirements for your products. <clears throat> cool, here we have the EU. So we're talking about EU market access requirements. So the question we're going to answer is, uh what are the requirements uh, related to you but let's first start with eu so when we talk about eu first we we see the two crosses here uh why is that remco well actually as we probably all know uh, there was a referendum in uh, the uk in 2016 and a majority majority of the people that voted voted to leave the european union and this is called brexit yeah and brexit effectively was the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union and it came into effect on February 1st, 2020. And you could say that as of 2020, the UK is the only member state ever to leave the EU. Okay, and so, um, they're not a part of this story anymore. Okay, so Christina, so does that actually mean when we're going to talk about EU requirements, then Britain will be like totally different from now on or? Are they still looking at us or working with us in terms of requirements or is that unclear yet? You would think they're on the safe side and they're out, but they're not. It's actually, since they're doing business with Europe and since we're connected, it will affect them directly or indirectly. So they're not out of the game. Okay, so they, they were trying to maybe align or um, talk to the EU about, okay, can we kind of still have the same or similar market access requirements, it, right? Exactly. And I mean, due to their history also, they're still trying to stick to the EU regulations. They know this is a state setting. They know these are the, the, the game makers, the rule makers in a way, and they will still um, want to keep their business and their um, economic activities so they will follow them as well. Cool. Okay. That's good to know uh, for all of us. Now, EU, what is EU anyway? Uh, how many countries are actually part of the EU? This is a question for you guys. This is a quiz, okay? So those who's got the right number, how many countries are actually part of EU right now? Type in your chat box and Remco will see who gets the right answer first. 
Okay, start typing people. So that's also a way for you to use the chat box. How many countries are part of the EU right now? No I'm answers going. yet. Okay, start typing people. How many countries? One, five, 12 and a half. How many countries are part of the EU? Use your chat box so I can also see if you can use your chat box. <clears throat> okay, anything coming in? No, I don't see anything coming in. Okay, people don't hesitate, um, unless you're not, you're not even hearing us, I think, but um, I think you are. So, how many countries? Who would like to take um, make a guess? Maybe I'm yep. missing something, but I don't see any answers I see coming in. I first uh, response uh, from uh, Riris Mahal Nanich. And he is um, making a, a short guess, and he's okay. telling us that there are 27 countries. Okay, oh, he's giving well. it away. So, who wins the prize? Is it Riris? Yes, absolutely. Actually, well there are many. Okay. There are many in the question. If you check uh, the. Also, uh... okay. it's good that we try this early on, so we know where to type the questions, and also. Uh, we know where to find the questions. So 27 is the right answer, um, but it's no longer um, the Br Great Britain. So, okay, so the, the market access requirements we're going to talk about are going to go for the whole of the EU, right? So whether I pop in here from the north side or from the south side, they still you still have to stick to the same regulations, right, Remco? Yes, absolutely. It doesn't matter where you come in, every okay, point of entry... Now? Yeah, but how about if I, you know, if I, well, how about if I pop in in Spain, like the southern people are usually more relaxed. Are they not saying, okay, you're not meeting all the requirements, but you can still come in, or is that no, not the case? It, no, it's really? not the case. You can't, you can't bribe them either. It doesn't matter if you come into Scandinavia or via Spain or Marseille or Greece. It doesn't really matter. Basically, the really rules and regulations are all the same. What if I squeeze in here, like between these bits of country, and then go to this tiny island here? Can I still not get away with less um, legal stuff? No, I know, I know you'd like to, case, but it's not going to happen. Okay, cool. So that's the point. It goes for the whole of EU. We are one common market, and the regulations goes for the whole set of countries, the whole of the EU, right? So, what requirements are we actually talking about? Um, let's talk about this. So first of all, yeah, the EU, um, the EU has its own flag, this one here, lovely. And so to enter the EU consumer goods market, uh, your products need to comply with the EU regulations. Eh? That's the statement, and that's actually facts. So to comply with EU regulations, why? What is actually the reasons that we have all these regulations? Uh, who could answer this for me in the chat box? Why do we have these regulations in the first place? Is it to keep you out, to make it difficult for you, uh, to favor our own European production, or are there other reasons behind all these regulations? Who could answer this one? Why do we have the regulations in the first place? Anybody? We have uh, an answer from uh, Lily, for instance, and okay, she's, uh, she, she's saying safety. Uh -huh. What kind of safety are we talking about? Good one, it's a good one. What kind of safety are we talking about? Like thieves entering the EU, that kind of safety, or is it other types of safety? <laughs> non-toxic, etc. Okay. was her answer. Cool. Remco, what would be your answer here? Well, my Would answer is basically also? there's one overarching principle, and that one overarching principle is consumer safety. Cool. And you can also say, as an addition, uh, environment will also come in, but the initial start has always been consumer safety. So Shiraz is very right. Okay, well done you, well done. Uh, prizes at the end of this show. Okay, so we're trying to protect consumer health and safety and the environment. And this kind of area is now for your, for home products, 
is basically covered by three EU laws. Yeah? We're looking at it like broadly now, and these are the three laws. Who could kind of um, explain a little bit? Remco, Christina, what does this actually mean? Well, you could say that the first one, product safety, uh, EU rules on product safety, they basically try to ensure that safe products are sold on the EU markets. And there's a second layer to that also, that any dangerous products that are actually entering the market, that they can be traced and be removed eh, to avoid any risk to consumers. So this is where you see this whole consumer safety thing popping up again. Mm -hmm. And then the second, yeah. See now? And, and the second one, the which one is really addressing what's in the product. So what chemicals, it's kind of restricting um, any hazardous substances. So we don't want to, one don't want products that expose any um, risks to human health or to the environment. So we're really looking at what's in the product. Um, do you have tests? Um, avoid specific bad chemicals. Cool, cool, good one. And the final one, third one. Yeah, it's liability. Eh? Basically, when any defective product causes any physical damage to consumers or their property, uh, it's the producer who has to provide compensation. And and the cool. basic story is actually that the company that imports your products is directly liable, but they will always deflect the liability to you as the producer, as their supplier. We have a very good example of that in a minute. Eh? So here, mm. this one, this is a what we call a famous storm in a teacup. Eh? This was a teacup introduced by IKEA of all people, like it's one of the biggest companies in our industry, and they introduced the teacup into the European market and it actually exploded when you put hot water in it. So that was quite faulty. So what was the what was the effect of all this? Well, in all these countries where they are selling it, and they are selling all over Europe, look, it got like it went like this. Germany, whatever, whatever, all these countries had to recall these products. And of course they do that in their own language. So this became like almost like a flood of recalls um, over this one product. So the result of that, obviously, that was extremely costly for IKEA. Um, they had to recall all these cups, and also it damaged their reputation. Eh? People think, "Oh wow, I, I shouldn't be buying my tableware from IKEA anymore because because it will be exploded." If this happens to a, an IKEA, it, does that affect you at all, Remco? How does this affect a supplier now if you were the supplier to IKEA? Well, like I said, basically, they're going to come back to you. Eh? They're going to deflect all responsibility back to you because they say eh, you didn't supply the goods as to our specifications. So they're going to take it out on you. It's as simple as that. So the importer's responsibility is actually also your responsibility. So in that sense, you are as responsible as IKEA would be. Yeah, and in fact, of course, IKEA is ordering from you. They will not order again from you, eh? or and they put claims on you. Uh, sorry, Christina. They will give you a big claim. Yeah. And this is really a red line that's following everything we're saying now. There is always an indirect effectness. So we'll see legislations, etc., and we think, ah, oh, yeah, we might be out there, but we somehow, as importers, as manufacturers, will be affected. So keep that in mind when we keep um, keep presenting and talking that it somehow will affect you and you're always part of the game. Exactly, well done. So yeah, there are EU regulations, we are trying to protect European consumers, but there's also your, um, um, your wanting to prevent the recall, because eh? recall could be not only painful to you, but maybe even deadly to your business. So two big reasons, consumer safety, and you want to avoid this kind of issue for your company. Okay, now, how risky are your products actually basically? Uh, we looked at that a little bit. So in 2022, uh, the main common product categories affected by claims and recalls were toys, which is not you most of the time, motor vehicles is not you, and also cosmetics. So those are the three um, most risky groups anyway in 2022. And the, the types of risk were chemical uh, related to injuries and choking. So basically also uh, not immediately you. Eh? Not immediately you. So maybe that's the first signal that you're not uh, the most risky group in the market. They, we also look at product categories and risks related to product categories. Um, so, team, can we say something about this kind of quickly? Can we highlight a few ones? 
that are um, especially risky or especially looked at in terms of regulations? Just pick one or two, yeah? Well, CE uh, marking, for instance, um, which is for basically in our sector, you could say for lighting, it's important. Uh, that is something you have to make sure that all the electrical components are functioning pro properly. But it also applies, for instance, to stuffed toys. Uh, there's a lot of companies we work with that make stuffed toys. For that, it also is applicable. Yeah, so specific and deeply detailed uh, regulations related to those groups because they are um, um, high-risk groups. Eh? I mean, if you choke a baby, that's not a nice thing to do. Christina, which one would you like to pick? Um, same for food contact. I mean, if you think also of our bowls, etc., it could be a de um, decorative bowl, but then um, people use differently and you don't want anything to migrate and go into the food and then be a health risk for the user. So that's also an important aspect. Exactly. Now, how about timber? Because some companies here in the audience today are doing wood does it relate to them what is the timber thing what, what are we looking at when we discuss timber mostly maybe Christina um timber Good. sorry um so timber is rather the sourcing where do we get the timber from is it um, um uh, where is it sourced from? Is it recycled wood? Uh, what are the components to it, etc.? So that would be key aspects, really sourcing and um, from recyclability, any um, cool. any substances in it. Yeah, and we're going to go into this uh, quite a lot um, as we progress in this presentation. So timber, we're coming back to this. But if we look at the groups and we look at the issues, common issues that um, have caused recalls and issues, we could maybe already say that we are fairly safe, we as Indonesians. Um, question mark. We're going to find out um, this um, during this conversation with you. Eh? So, but you're not in high risk groups uh, immediately if we look at it um, from a glance. Let's progress. Okay. Oh, by the way, um, there's also this, also no go. This is for the chat box. What is no go about this kind of thingy here? This is a nice statue. Why is it not allowed? Anybody from the chat box? Why is it no go, this one? If you don't know, you can guess. <clears throat> Why is this one no go? Anybody? Okay, then Ooh, if nobody... We have an answer of uh, Babang, who um, okay. was saying to us that uh, she thinks it's uh, sleep. And Lily is asking us if it's, if it's uh, ivory. Ah, yes. Lily is right again, eh? Ooh, she's got two cakes now. Eh? She won one already, and now she's going to get the second cake at the end of this show. So, yes, this is ivory. What is wrong about this, Christina? Well, um... It's the use of the material, like uh, there's restriction on the, on the use of the material. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, re, there's poses of conflict, it's animal protects, etc. So it's forbidden to be used anymore. Exactly. So ivory you cannot use anymore because it comes from the ele elephant's tusk and we are protecting this animal now. Okay, so ivory is just no go. Eh? So some materials are listed as uh, prohibited. The second one here, this is again for you to guess. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yep. Levi has a, a question. Um, she's asking if it's not appropriate for some uh, religion. Well, it's not. You can still do the Buddha uh, if you want to, uh, but not in ivory. So, if, if people want the ivory for religious reasons, uh, I'm sorry, but, but it's no go for the EU. So, but I think if they want to do the image, like the, the Buddha in whatever shape or form, you can use other materials. So that is that's then it's okay. So this material, the ivory, is just listed as no go. Very clear. Hope that, hope that answers your question. Then the second one here, those two nice watering cans. What's wrong with these people? Tell me. Why is why is one of them no go? Okay, Lily, try to go for your third cake. Yeah, here. <laughs> She can start a cake shop by the end of this story. Oh, she's good, eh? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? 
why is this the one on the right not allowed? Start typing, otherwise Remco is going to give it away. Then he gets the cake. I don't want him I to get, get the cake. cake. Yes, hey. Jeff says it's a copy. And Jeff is very, very, very right. Uh, the watering can on the right is an illegal copy. Uh, and the EU, they want to respect copyrights. So the moment you steal a design, uh, you could say you are not allowed to enter the market. And the original okay. project on the left is made by Kojo. And actually, the one on the right is a copy by a company from China called Senaka. Uh, there's a website on this that can give you more information on uh, okay. how to deal with these rights. Cool. Okay, so guys, don't copy. But of course, in Indonesia, we never copy. Uh, we are like saints. We never do anything that belongs to somebody else. So we are safe here. Uh, but just as a warning, yeah, mostly to other countries, not to Indonesia. Okay, so how can we know for sure what regulations apply to um, to our products? The answer is ask, ask. Okay, so that's a simple answer, um, and we we put it like this, like this big on the screen, because this is something that normal and actually good leading businesses do. They connect really well. So if they don't know. They know how to find the information. And so this is why also when you don't um, know exactly what the regulations are related to your product group, uh, you should you should ask. Um, Remco, who who can you ask as a um, as a company from Indonesia? Well, there's Where many, many people you can ask, yeah, but you can also, for instance, ask uh, there's a ministry of trade. Hey, they have all kinds of information. Um, okay. There's all kinds of institutions like branch organizations that you could ask. You can, yeah. of course, furniture yeah. association. Yeah. Who else you can we ask? Well, you can also ask your coaches, yeah, your Elizabeth and your Solly, and you can ask. Uh, well, let's see who else can we do. You have ah yes, and the one I keep forgetting, the website we always like to recommend, which is your EU trade assistant. Here we go. We're, try, we're going to try this one out in a minute, okay? So okay. the first thing you can always do, everybody can do, is just go online. And there's an EU tool for you, for all of you, uh, that will help you um, listing the requirements that you that apply to your specific product. And we're going to practice with this one in a minute, okay? So that's why I'm starting with that one. It's called the EU Trade Assistant, and we're going to um, give you the details in a minute. Yes, your Ministry of Trade or Ministry of Commerce or equivalent. Uh, your customs so in your country there's already a lot of um, resources available for you in terms of information and your buyer don't never forget that it's never a foolish thing to ask your buyers what what are you doing and what what do we have to stick to um, yeah, and a good thing about your buyer is that they know very well which rules do apply because they probably also import similar products from other suppliers so they know all the ins and outs and they will give you all the right tips and tricks. Yeah, I have to ask my dog to. to <laughs> what we're okay, the buyer, and then also your colleagues, uh, the furniture association or any associations like you have Himki, I think, in Indonesia. Um, and so all these people can um, can help you out, right? And of course, last but not least, um, last but not least, um, you have. Now I'm getting stuck here. <laughs> okay. You have external experts. Yes. Okay. My dog is gone. Sorry about this. Uh, it adds a little bit of flavor of homeworking eh, today. Okay. So you also have external experts. We're so lucky today to have um, Christina here. But generally, there are always uh, external experts that you can find uh, around you. Eh? Um, and Today we talk with Christina, so make sure you, you pop your questions up in the chat box so that we, she can help you getting your answers. And we okay. strongly so. recommend ask because in not asking, like not knowing doesn't protect you. We're talking about regulations, about standards that's being set up, and you need to know. And if there's no bad question, there's no stupid questions, ask, ask so you know what to do. Good one, eh? Hamad is home. Uh, it's not stupid to ask, ever. Uh, it's actually stupid not to ask. So good one, huh? And also the second point Christina is really making, yes, I mean, uh, when you get caught or when you don't meet regulations and you get a recall, you cannot say, I didn't know. 
you can never say that it, it, that doesn't count so uh, anyway let's go to the online tool uh, which is called access to market here you find the, the link you can go into it later maybe some of you already know it it's a very handy tool for actually finding your regulations so we're going to have a look into it it's called access to market and the tool is called the eu trade assistant it looks like this okay uh in yellow and blue and there are three boxes here um so here it's asking you what is your product and here it's asking where are you from in this case indonesia and where are you selling to i just chose netherlands uh, because we are talking from the netherlands and so um you need to know your products okay here now this is hs code based uh, most of you who are a little bit more experienced already know your hs code uh, but some may not know okay and all your products each individual product uh, has um, has its own SK, uh, hs code or the group of products so what if you can't find that um, if you don't know your hs code my advice is go to the world customs organization they have the best list around um, of hs codes related to product groups uh, so the link is here if you are unsure about your hs code then as your homework you should go there and find your hs code but we're going to show you a few examples okay because we looked at your product offering and basically there are three main groups uh in terms of hs codes that apply to your products today one is chapter 46 that is for basketry and woven natural fibers okay so if you look deeply here you see this could be fibers of bamboo rattan and other fibers like water hyacinth you name it any natural fiber which is used for basketry and weaving um, actually has this 46 group of hs codes and we're going to show you the requirements in a minute okay so that's the bigger group for a lot of you um, then the second big group for all of you uh, for most of you is actually furniture and chairs so if you look in chapter 94 of the hs code list uh, you'll find chairs made of uh, wood uh, bamboo rattan other materials okay so most of the requirements you will find under that chapter 94 again we're going to show you in a minute then there's also 94 um, for um, other types of furniture than chairs so cupboards sideboards you have it so those are the three main groups i think for us in the audience today uh, there is one that is a little bit confusing which is uh, 44 and it's called wood so those of you who are in wood may be tempted to go and look in in that chapter but it's mostly for timber and wood related to construction it's like door panels and uh, planks even huh? so it's not immediately useful if you do wood and you do furniture chairs then you go to 94 furniture um, but there are two exceptions here as you can see under 44 one is for tableware so if you do tableware in wood or bamboo or related kind of woods um, then you might find 4419 very useful uh, if you do statuette figurines uh, which mo a lot of you do I know um, then 44.20 is the is your place to go okay but we're going to focus on those two ones the main ones here the basketry 46 and 94 furniture for the rest uh, you this is your homework and just deep dive into it yourself cool so we're going back to the tool and now we know that we, we should be in chapter 46 right so I'm typing 46.2 because that's what the list was telling me. And then I'm going to click. Here we go. Okay, basketry woven natural materials. And then this pops up the chapter of, okay, um, I'm from Indonesia to the Netherlands. I want to know my import requirements. So here on the left-hand side, we actually see the left, we see the import requirements. There's also lots of other stuff. So it's a very useful tool. Uh, it tells you a lot about generally about exporting your product group to the EU. But for today, we're focusing on the requirements. So there are two sets here. One, the general requirements, which goes for all exporters of products, consumer goods to the EU. So it tells you a little bit about packing list, uh, invoices, and generally what you have to do. 
but we are more focused on the specific requirements for basketry and woven, woven natural fibers. So there are two listed here on the left hand side, as you see in my nice round circle here. Um, one is related to food contact. Okay, so if you if you do weaving uh, related to um, um, products that come into contact with food, then the, this rule applies to you. So what examples do we actually have of woven natural fibers that come into food contact? Who can give me an example of a product group that is related to this? Use your chat box, people. What woven natural fibers can come into food contacts? So if you produce those products, you really have to go into those requirements. Anybody? Nobody? And maybe we should mention. Oh, we have, uh, Riri's ah. that is uh, going for bread baskets. Yeah, good one, Riri's. Good one. And so, Lily also says a food basket. Yeah, fruit also. basket. Yeah. Fruit bowl, I see from David. Yeah, maybe even things like placemats, although that's kind of borderline. But yes, things that come into direct contact with food then if you are producing products for your buyer uh, that you sell like that, then you must go into these requirements. And then you must go further into this. We don't have time for this now. Um, but most of the time, I know from your end, your baskets are um, decorative and so don't generally come into contact with food. But for those weavings and natural fibers that do, then you must go into this. And then the second one is, uh, natural fibers that are used for packaging okay an example of that maybe remco so if you use specifically for packaging what can what could be a, a product that is related to this you mean packaging in natural fibers yes yes so you use it specifically for packaging so not decorative but maybe it goes into a supermarket and it's packed for something it's packaging for something yeah, you mean for, for, for like meals or something? Yeah, that or um, I remember that in my old days uh, when I used to work for the importer wholesaler, we used to have bottles of wine and we packed them in Abaka uh, natural fiber, woven natural fiber boxes from Thailand. So yes. if, if your buyer is buying packaging from you in your natural fibers, then you must go into these requirements. Okay. We but actually in most used cases, to have... Sorry. We actually used to have an Indonesian brand of food here in the Netherlands, and they had a, a woven basket in which you could buy that food. There you go. So then it applies yeah. to you. I know in most cases of you in the audience now today, uh, you neither produce products in, uh, that come into contact with food or packaging. It's mostly decorative. So it means that for this group, for, your, for you guys in this group, you're mostly safe. There are no deep, specific product requirements uh, from the EU, unless you treat your um, fibers uh, and you treat them or you use finishing materials like chemicals or stuff like that, and we come to that later. Okay. Mm. But mostly, but if, if it's in natural. Christina? Well, yeah. You're raising a good point. Um, we shouldn't focus on the product only, but we also need to consider packaging. So that's really an important thing because you often say, oh, we just produce something, but we have to think about the surrounding as well. So, mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So I think mostly in your group you are safe uh, unless you you cheat your do you, you not cheat but you treat your products uh, with chemicals. Then we come back to this later. So most of you in this group are actually quite fine. Let's move on to the furniture. This is ninety four zero one, and let's see what it gives us. Um, chairs of wood and natural fibers or natural materials. Sorry. So here we again on the left hand side. We have um, the requirements and let's look at the specific requirements that goes for the product group of wooden furniture. Okay. Um, now this concerns most of you or a lot of you anyway. So first of all, here we have the specific import requirements. And the first one that pops up is uh, if you are using cat and dog fur on your furniture, which I think mostly you don't, mostly you don't. Obviously, um, this this replies to upholstery so i think most of you don't do this 
uh, and so therefore you're fine. So this one does not apply, I think, to any of you. Any, but should in case, should you have anything like that in it, then you must go and look and read this uh, requirement and um, stick to the regulations. Okay, so I'll skip over this labeling of textiles. How does this apply to uh, furniture, Remco? Well, if you're using upholstery uh, made out of textile, there you go. Exactly. So this is those of you who are upholstering, and some of you are. Um, then you must apply to this labeling of textiles regulation. So then you must read it and make sure you comply with this set of regulations. Okay. So for those of you who are doing upholstery uh, with textiles, um, you must you must know this. Then the next one here is CITES. This is about endangered species and the protection of it. Um, let's go a little bit more deeply into this one, okay? Because it does apply um, almost to all of you using wood. So CITES, this is the, the regulation, is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Now remember we had the slide with the ivory, this would come under the CITES regulation. So that's why it's forbidden. So let's talk a little bit about this. Christina, can you take us through this? What does CITES mean uh, in these terms of aspects? Sure. Um, so first of all, you need to um, legally obtain your resources, your materials you use. Um, then it's about the sustainability. So the sustainability aspect, as we see here, it's that from the sourcing perspective, etc., you need to follow the entire supply chain and kind of know it's sustainably um, produced, sourced, etc. And traceability is really the key that you can track, that you know where it comes from, and that you can say, okay, I've used that material, there's the origin, have a certificate or something, and being able to provide that to your customers. Exactly. So uh, if, you're more, if your wood has been smuggled in, then it's not legal. If, it, if there's no replanting system, that's also not sustainable. And if you know, don't know where, even, even don't know where it comes from, uh, you're also going against the CITES regulations. Eh? So um, how can people know whether their product comes under the CITES regulation? How can they know? They can look into the system or, you know, by also you just showed um, the requirements in the, um, the database. There you would see if there is a reference to it and when they're unsure. Exactly. So it's actually there's actually a list that you can uh, check out. Eh? So I know a lot of you are using teak wood. Uh, and so you can find whether this is allowed or not. Uh, and for instance, I also know some of you use suar uh, wood. And then, yeah, check it out and see if it's there. Eh? Um, and not, mostly it's based on the, I think, the original Latin uh, label of the name. So it has a list. Uh, you should cross check it uh, and then make sure you apply to the CITES regulations. Um, and often they're asking you to uh, include a certification um, uh, un under the CITES uh, rule uh, in your documentation. Okay, so this really applies to you. You should all know what type of wood you have and where it comes from. That's CITES. So then uh, the final one is the voluntary eco label for wooden furniture. Okay. So um, we see it's also called the flower label uh, because it has a flower logo. And I want to go a little bit more deeply into this because it does apply uh, to most of you, or if not all of you. So this is a voluntary eco label for wooden furniture. Uh, you can find it in the system and it has its own website, www.ecolabel. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So um, it's voluntary. That's great, eh? So let's not do it. <laughs> if you don't have to do it, let's not do it. So is that the advice we want to give them, um, Remco? Okay, if it's, it's voluntary anyway, so you don't have to do it, so let's not do it. Well, of course, if you don't do it, you'll be the same as most others. Eh? But if you do do it, you are standing out eh? and people are identifying you as, as a company that's producing more eco-friendly products. So in that sense, um, it's not a bad thing to contemplate. Exactly. So other three reasons are, it is already a group with the lowest environmental impact, this wooden furniture, as you saw. Uh, it's not amongst CE marking areas. 
so it's relatively easy to do. Uh, it helps consumers. So it, it's very much a marketing tool if you go for this kind of certification. And we all need to be part of the circular economy anyway very soon. So, but maybe we should consider it. So whether or not you're going to get the label, we're going to talk a little bit more about it because there's stuff there that is really important for you. So let's go deeper. It applies to all types of furniture, eh? chairs and other types of wooden furniture. And wood includes wood, cork, bamboo or rattan and some other wood types that are um, made from legal sustainably managed forests. Okay, so it covers more than just wood, also the bamboo and the rattan is included. Okay, now what is it that, what is it saying? We're promising there are no hazardous substances uh, and no harmful residues in the upholstery and also low formaldehyde emissions. So my question to maybe Christine is, okay, so if it's a voluntary label, this is already a must do, right? So why? So we must apply to this anyway, eh? whether we go for the label or not or, or not. It's kind of compiling what's already also good practice. I mean, we talk about it's a label of excellence. We want to be outstanding. And so it's really bringing everything together and yeah, allowing people to do it. So yeah, there is no, no choice in a way because it also feeds in the entire regulatory landscape. If we look, you do mention circular economy. So we have the Green Deal, the big picture, and all that legislation looks at eco-design and having more environmentally friendly, more sustainable products. So it's in a way a recommendation, but it's going beyond. It's really a um, must-do in a way already. Exactly, exactly. And especially this kind of stuff, you can't have chemical substances uh, beyond a little threshold. Uh, so I, we strongly advise you to um, go online and find the user manual. Uh, I've given you the link already before in a few slides before. Check the manual, uh, see what it says. And then of course, it's up to you to, um, to apply for the label or not. But I think we, that's up to you. But we do want you just to look at the underlying issues because it's all related to doing, a norm, doing normal business. Uh, so it should be part of your quality assurance procedures to know what's in your products and what you can and cannot do. Um, you also have to do record keeping. So all of you, if you don't have them, this is not, and this is new to you, this is something you should build. Bill of materials, spec sheets, uh, you should have an admin system that actually um, contains all these product uh, related issues in it. And then finally, testing is a normal part of your procedure. If you are in any of those areas um, where you might have a risky product, Okay, so it's already normal practice anyway. Um, and I would say check this manual um, because it has a lot of those very specific thresholds for, um, for things that you can use. And I think one of the conclusions we are reaching in this uh, manual is that, yeah, if you do um, blonde wood, like untreated wood, then mostly you are fine. If you go into upholstery, you're entering into areas that are tricky, then you must go and test and find out. Um, if you treat your wood, like for instance, you, you're, putting, um, uh, uh, you're putting certain substances uh, on the wood to protect it or to shield it from the, uh, from the climate or um, to make it fire retardant, then I think uh, once you treat your wood, you're also going into this area and you need to know Okay, so I think it's a very, very good tool. If you go into it, you find actually, you find specific tables um, with your compliance in terms of treated wood. So we advise you to go and study this, all of you. So how about recycled wood? Is this an exception? Or what, what does it say about recycled wood? Christina. So on the one hand, um, res using recycled wood is encouraged because of the circular economy. At the same time, yeah. there's also thresholds. You have limits. You have to, you mentioned formaldehyde. We see here cadmium, chromium, etc. And if you don't know where your wood comes from and you don't have any certificates, any chain of custody documents from from your um, seller, then you need to conduct the testing yourself. Go to an accredited cool. lab. There is um, 
simple um, chemical weather analysis tests, XRF, et cetera. This is standardized tests. Sometimes they burn the product and then just see what comes out of it. But you need to ensure that you keep those thresholds, not to pose any risk, because otherwise that's a stop, a barrier to import to Europe. Cool. And this is taken from the manual, this very specific table here. And it has lots of tables um, uh, on the other parts of your uh, wooden furniture. So we all advise you to study it and know it. And of course, go into testing because uh, you cannot test this yourself most of the time. So this includes recycled wood as well. Eh? So when you have recycled, it doesn't exclude you from uh, making sure those thresholds are not reached. Okay, then uh, also for time's sake, I'm trying to speed up a little bit. So we also have the EU um, EUDR. This is the EU um, deforestation regulation. Um, Christina, can you take us through this in a, in a minute, if you can? This is your challenge. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, Europe is uh, looking at um, how they can reduce their impact. And we talked about recycled wood now. Now it's about the, the primary material. And we don't want to support deforestation somewhere else in the world. And that's why they want to partner with the countries to ensure the transition to move away from deforestation or to, towards deforestation free supply chains and this is already starting as of uh, December 24 and it's really about tracing where does your wood come from getting certificates and um, um, it, it also states like Indonesia is active in there and the EU is support, supporting the country so you're not on your own it's really a joint mission collaboration to reduce that footprint and to take care of that. Cool. And we're not only doing this in the EU, but your Indonesian government is very actively involved in this uh, as well. And they are um, in bilateral uh, discussions with the EU, um, EU government, let's say, uh, very actively to align those regulations. So if you don't do it for yourself or for the EU, um, your government also tell, soon tell you to do this. So study this. Um, we're leaving the we're leaving the. Um, uh, the link there for you, the EUDR is really coming to you. Okay, so time for a little takeaway. Um, let me call Gojek and uh, get some food out for you because we've deserved it by now, I think. So takeaway number one. Here we go. Know your requirements. So this is really about your internal process. Okay, so you know have to know the EU regulations. You have to check your products and make sure they comply. Okay, so have a system uh, for knowing this and doing this. The second is follow your quality management system or set it up. So this is also for the coaching now today. Make sure that all the companies um, do this. So your quality management process um, or your standing operation procedure, as it's sometimes called, should include testing, verification, either in-house or external, depending on how complex it is. You should have an admin system, including spec sheets and bills of materials um, related to each and individual each individual product. And then finally, good housekeeping uh, to manage all this and do it. OK, so this is a process tip uh, and recommendation for all of you. Uh, and one of the takeaways from the first section um, of our discussion today. Let's move on. Okay, certification. So the question you asked us, are there any relevant certifications uh, that apply to us? Um, we can be long and short about it, but I think uh, we're going to be short about it. <laughs> have FSC, which is very active also in Indonesia. Um, Christina, can you just talk us through um, FSC? What does it mean? And what mm -hmm. do those three labels mean? Mm -hmm. FSC stands for Forest Stewardship Council. It's really a certificate um, for the timber um, sourcing. Um, we see here the three examples. The one is 100%, so it states it's 100% sourced from, um, um, from certified um, forests that are sustainably managed. We see the recycled one, so you can have 100% recycled, so the products are made 100% of recycled wood, which is also with capacity kind of followed through and um, traced and then there's the mixed um, the mixed uh, label which is a probably a light version which is mixing FSC certified forest wood with others controlled um, 
managed forest. So it really gives an indication of what wood you have used and what is in the product. Exactly. And the good thing about it, it's very specific for wood. Huh? Uh, there are also a few minuses, because if you want to source from FSC um, controlled places, then they don't always have all the woods. Huh? So it's not a solution for all your wood, but it's the most specific wood certification uh, that we know and also that is most popular worldwide. Um, in Europe, like any paper that is being used for packaging, uh, um, is from an FSC source, for instance. So in Europe, we're already quite used to it, uh, and maybe you should consider it for your wood. It's the only one, the very specific one that we have for wood. There are no other specific ones on natural fibers or woods uh, that are commercial enough for us to mention it even today. So FSC is your source, your go-to source. Study it if you want to go for it. Um, that's really up to you. But there are many other certifications around, but they are more general um, organizational or corporate certifications. Uh, and we're going to spend a minute just to introduce the main ones to you. Okay, so, but there's a whole forest of it. So like it's quite, there's, there's so many certification around um, and we can just like select a few for you. One of the first one here is this nice BSCI flower. What is BSCI, Christina? Um. It stands for Business Social Compliant Initiative, so it's really looking about your social activities in a way. Cool. Okay, so that's a yeah, social and one. one. And there's one remark here. It's not actually a certification. It provides companies mm -hmm. with a social auditing methodology and reporting. And so yeah. it's it's the old one out yeah, in the in the whole forest you're describing, case. Cool. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. SA eight thousand. What does that mean and what does it stand for? Christina, well, maybe? it's the world's... Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah? Well, yeah. it's the, the world's leading social <laughs> certification program. Uh, and, and it does provide a framework for all kinds of organizations and all types in any industry uh, to conduct business in a way which is fair and decent for its workers and also to show that you adhere to the highest social standards. Cool. Social, yeah. Okay, ISO, Christina? ISO, um, classically, would be the ISO 40001 management system. So it's really setting the standard of the, the game. How you, you said housekeeping earlier, so it's how you manage environmental aspects or quality management. So general standards for uh, organizational setup. Cool, okay. It's 11 o'clock here. You can hear my clock in the background. Okay, another flower. Fair trade, yes. WFTO, Remco? Yes, well, it's both social and environmental. The World Fair Trade Organization has its famous 10 principles. They've had yeah. them since when, case? Since the 1940s or something? 40 or 57? Yeah, well, for the a long, first long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my company that I worked for in the Netherlands was the first one in Europe, actually, the first fair trade company. Uh, and we were still working on the principles by then. Um, but yes, it's social and environmental uh, and it has 10 principles. And what's important, it's a bottoms up approach. So it really comes from suppliers like you, they have set it up and they form the organization. So it's really relevant and uh, appropriate to, to SMEs because it comes from SME reality. Huh? So it doesn't go over your head. It's really appropriate for SMEs. Next one, SEDEX. SEDEX, again, an auditing scheme, it's really looking at sustainable supply chains and sustainable reporting and uh, practices. Cool. Okay. Actually quite uh, used a lot. Huh? We see it a lot. And then finally, the eco label. Now, the EU is coming in with its own label, but um, and we just described it huh, to you. So we're not going to go in it. Uh, what's a little bit um, strange is that, that it's already a forest of certifications, and now they come in with a label, which is a kind of certification. Why did they do that? Well, the one thing is they part of the whole green deal um, movement that we're going to get is to um, be a little bit more targeted in all these certifications and systems and to have maybe maybe work in the end towards one common tool uh, and then still different organizations can ha have their own take on it. Now it's a forest. You so sometimes don't even know um, what it means or how it works. And the EU is trying to kind of taper that a little bit. Okay, so those are corporate certifications. Now we as experts here, here we are, um, 
do we recommend any specific uh, certification? I think that's a question most of you would like to ask. Remco, are we recommending any? I say no. No, not specifically. I mean, it really depends on your situation, uh, whom you're supplying to, what they would like to see, uh, what kind of business you are, what you feel comfortable with, what is suitable for, for your situation. So we don't specifically recommend one. Uh, we do recommend you to research it and see what could be suitable for you. Good one. Okay, so does your buyer recommend one? Yeah, usually they have a preference. Uh, um, and uh, different buyers, they have different preferences. So whenever you get into business with, uh, with buyers, uh, a lot of times they send you a form and they ask you, fill out your environmental and social certifications. Uh, so they want to know. Uh, and if you don't have any, uh, you'll have to explain about how you conduct your business. Uh, so they may have preferences. If they have preferences, they will definitely communicate those to you. Um, and in some cases, um, they want you to have a certification or at least be able to show that you are practicing your business in a socially and environmentally responsible manner. So if you don't have a certification, you have to be able to at least show what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. So buyer definitely has preference normally. Uh, by the way, people, this is the time for, to pop your questions about certification. We're going to answer a few more questions that we have ourselves. But your questions are very welcome. Do it now um, while we are talking about the subject. So use the chat box. We will um, try to answer your questions about certification. So third question, does it cost any money in terms of um, by having a certification? Christina, is it, does it cost money? It does. It does cost your own effort. It does cost auditing and certification. And it does, yeah. So okay. there is cost associated to it. Okay, so this should be now part of your cost calculation. Eh? If you go for a certification, uh, it's part of your. Of it, you have you have benefits out of it as well. Once you have your processes controlled, yet once you have information, depending on how far you go with your process, you you'll also have savings. Yes. So yes, we are coming from yes, certification extremely useful, uh, but be aware that you're going to, it's an investment also, eh? mm -hmm. but it also has lots of benefits. So final question from our side. So does it cost money? It says no, but this is a real yes, but you don't want to pay, but that you have to do that anyway. Is it a marketing tool eh, to have certification? We say yes and no. What do we mean by that? Well, basically you could say that uh, yes, it's a marketing and communication tool. Uh, having a certain certification, already explains to the world what you do in certain areas. And so in that sense, it's definitely a communication tool. And it will also save you a lot of time in communicating up and down with respect to what you do and what you don't do. Okay. At the other hand, you can also say that uh, it's a bit of a fluid situation. Uh, we're talking about buyer preferences at the moment, what buyers find desirable in terms of certification. But if you, as you have already seen eh, throughout this whole presentation, things are continuously changing. Eh? So you can also say that what is desirable today could be mandatory tomorrow. Eh? So in that sense, things are continuously changing. Okay. I Let's have a have... question in the case. Yeah, come with, come with the question before yes. we go to Kodiak. Yeah. Yes, we, we have two questions about certifications. Uh, there's one question about the TSCA, certification for plywood. Is that mandatory? This is what IU asks. Okay, do you know that one, uh, Christina, or is it something we need to check? Uh, we need to check. I'm aware of it because with plywood, we have specifics with formaldehyde, et cetera, and emissions, but I would okay. need to check about the mandatory. Cool. Uh, and this could also okay. be part of the manual, by the way, eh? the eco uh, manual. Um, I bet you it's almost there. So you can also study the manual, but we'll come back to this um, if you don't mind. Second okay. question. Yeah, there's actually a, th a second and a third. Uh, are there any relevant certifications for Rotan? No, they are not. It comes under either FSC or you go for the general certifications. So no okay. specific ones. And then last but not least, people want to actually know more about EUDR. Yeah? They like to have more detail about EUDR. Good. Okay. 
well, this is not the time and the place. Uh, I gave you the website. Uh, it has a very clear website. You can read up on it. As I also said, Indonesian government is very actively involved in this whole discussion. Um, and so you can also try to uh, contact your ministry uh, and see if they could maybe do a session on this with you. That would be very nice, I think. Eh? So this could be homework for the ministry. And maybe just one short addition. Right now, this uh, mandatory implementation is focusing uh, strongly on the palm oil sector because that's the one with the biggest impact. So it's about certification and tracing and it will yeah. become more relevant and it might then come to other sectors as well, but it starts with palm oil. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit more deeply into it in a minute, um, if you allow us. Eh? Let's do the takeaways for the certification, okay? Here's, here he goes. So certification certainly meets needs. Eh? The underlying needs are that people want to uh, um, be more sustainable and uh, buy more sustainable. So the, especially the new consumer and buyer generations, which is the generation, the millennials and the generation Z, the, even the younger generation, they vote with their wallet. wallet. So that means that they want to see what you're doing in terms of sustainability. Um, also now we see many buyers now from the millennial generation popping up. For them uh, to be sustainable is just almost like a basic requirement. So keep that in mind. The new consumer will be much more forceful on this uh, and therefore certification could meet a need because by that you assure these people that they are, um, that they are buying good. Also, this generation uh, doesn't so much believe in corporate marketing uh, talk. They, uh, mm -hmm. they really look at their own uh, friends online and they really um, look at that kind of recommendation. So to have certification certainly helps this new buyer that is really coming towards us. Follow the CBI trend documents. We talk a lot about this new buyer. Okay. Then also but after the COVID. One thing is, James, yeah, if, I may, if I may add. Um, at the one hand, yes, people are pushing for sustainability, but they are not really willing to pay much more for it. Uh, research has shown it's roughly between 2 and 5% people are willing to pay more for a sustainable product. So they want it to be sustainable, but they don't want to pay much more. They see it as your problem in a way. Uh, okay. Yes, absolutely. So it's also certification helps us against greenwashing. And this is the thing that people are telling stories and they're not actually true. We're going to go into greenwashing in a minute under the Green Deal, okay? So greenwashing means not telling you the truth about what you're really doing. We're going to come back to this. So certification helps that because it tells you exactly what, um, what you are doing and also there's underlying proof of it. So there's different attitudes, there's risk and opportunity. Some people say, okay, I want to protect myself, so I want to buy 27 different certifications and put them all on my products. Uh, and some people just say, I want this certification and I really tell my story. So like more from a positive kind of view. Um, be aware of that, that buyers sometimes think defensive and sometimes think offensive, like let's have a marketing story. There's also a lot of pull from retailers today. Uh, we can actually prove this. So this one says almost 89.5% of European retailers, uh, for them sustainability is a factor. This is being measured all the time. Uh, for instance, by Maison Objet Trade Fair, uh, their online tool. And so more and more retailers uh, want this now in the EU. So a lot of people always say to me, but nobody ever asks. Well, they are, they are saying it. They are saying it. So if they don't ask, you tell. So there's a lot of retailer pool. And finally, there's also trade fairs now advocating this. Christina, you're part of this, and so am I. What is this? The, ethic, the ethical style is really promoting um, products or giving a platform for products that are, are more sustainable. We're looking at um, the, the materials that are being used. We're looking about the working condition, labor condition, manufacturing, etc. So it's really awarding, um, um, yeah, platform and kind of a label to those products. Exactly. So Messe Frankfurt, one of the biggest trade fairs that we have. They have Ambiente and a few other big, biggies. They actually have a ethical style guide. So that's for any exhibitor in those fairs. They can get they can get included in the ethical style guide, and they get this shield on their booth, green shield. And there's a jury uh, deciding the applications for the ethical style guide based on criteria of sustainability. And um, 
this is a little secret, but both Christina and me are part of this jury. So um, send your bribes along, right? But this is the this is another important uh, fact that trade fairs are now also advocating sustainability. They are saying let sustainability be a normal part of the conversation. So on fairs we talk about price and quality and design, but we also talk about sustainability now. So this is a big move in the right direction. So yes, if you are certified, you're meeting a lot of needs. So we are actually recommending uh, certification, relevant certification for most of you. Eh? Oh wow, he's now accelerating. Eh? And the final one, we should all be aware of this. Governments are now stepping in, not just EU government, but also your government. Okay, so your government, is talking uh, to the EU uh, almost on a daily basis on all of those topics. And I picked a few topics. One is about regulations. So Indonesia wants to align regulations that you have with our regulations in the EU. So that means it's going to happen. It's not going to fade away. Transparency is a big topic they talk about amongst each other. Customs and trade facilitation is one of the topics. And then finally, trade and sustainable development is on the table. So when they talk about this, this means at some stage, uh, there will be law. Huh? And the idea is that they align the regulations between those two partners. Now it so happens that, of course, the EU is huge. Indonesia is only one country. So the alignment might be a little bit more towards the EU, but certainly your government is very actively engaged in this whole discussion. Uh, including sustainable development. So be aware of that. And um, yeah, so at some stage, you're not just going to have to apply to EU norms, but also to your own Indonesian norms. This takes us to the third and final sector of our, it says certification, but it should be Green Deal. Sorry for the error. So we're talking about the EU Green Deal and uh, we have, um, uh, I think, one of the best experts around, uh, but although she's very modest herself, Christina, to, about this topic. So she's going to basically uh, tell us that this idea of the Green Deal, it just didn't just pop up from the air, it just mm -hmm. didn't fall down. It had a history. Yeah? Can you quickly take us through the history yeah. of the idea? Sure. It's a bit fitting in the entire landscape. We have an issue. The issue is like climate change, combating climate change and the resulting um, negative impact. So that's really their starting. So we have the Paris Agreement where they said, okay, we need to stop global warming at two degrees. Um, then based on that, we said, okay, how can uh, nations control that? We have to control our, our in finance investments. Only with investing, you can control and support uh, sustainable activities. Um, we see the EU, EU Green Deal, which is really the EU committed to by 2050 to be more sustainable, to be um, um, reduce emissions, etc., um, achieve decarbonization in a way. So that's the big picture where all the other legislations and also the eco label, etc., fits in. Um, and then um, with taxonomy and other laws, um, climate neutral, etc., it's about disclosing about how every manufacturer, every company, every nation can contribute to this overall uh, mission. Yeah, so taxonomy is a difficult word, huh? but it means basically uh, they're creating law, huh? they're creating there's, a system. Yeah. Exactly. It's about KPIs. It's about there's six goals, um, carbon, water, waste, etc., circularity, and then you have to disclose how your activities contribute um, to a more sustainable world. So it's really um, KPI disclosure as part of reporting. Okay. And then finally, we ended up with the EU climate uh, exactly. The climate law, this is the translation into it. Okay, by 2050, we want to be climate neutral, meaning we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 55% as opposed to the pre-industrial levels. And this is now written into law. It's not just a commitment. We want to do something. It's no, we have to achieve it. And that's why then the EU kind of had this milestones. Um, if we jump to the next slide, we can maybe quickly see how they formulated targets, etc. Cool. Okay. So first of all, let's take you back to what is the Green Deal in terms of its definition. Eh? So mm -hmm. 
Uh, it promises so to reduce net greenhouse gas gas emissions to zero to zero in the EU by 2050. Yeah, that's the big promise, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, and yeah. we want to be a, a front runner, so it's about um, reducing the exactly by 2050. We want to be the first Europe. It wants to be the first continent to be carbon neutral. Um, and they have set specific targets how to achieve that climate neutrality and <clears throat> exactly and, and um with those targets we want to be uh, climate neutral by 2050 and we want to reduce co2 etc they have set up action programs um of which uh, yeah the action programs um that affect almost every uh, european co economy it's about forestry policies fair transition funds etc so there's many activities in that and those programs result into initiatives um you see a few examples you just heard about the eu taxonomy the csrd which is the big word now it's the corporate social responsibility directive it's about reporting disclosing as a company you need to say what you're doing and also um report special kpis it's also the circular economy action plan which we also go in a minute in a bit in more detail but thinking about circularity reducing waste etc and it's really about uh, sanctions. So we say we have a problem, we target, we address that with programs and initiatives and everyone has to fulfill it. If you're not um, complying with those laws, there will be sanctions. It's not directly clear what effect it has yet, but it's announced, it's a law. We have to all follow it and be part of it. Cool. So <laughs> actually, uh, we're going to discuss uh, two of those initiatives in a minute. Eh? So to give you a little bit more detail, uh, but it is happening, it will happen, but it's also still in progress, right, Christina? Yeah, it's evolving. Um, you mentioned earlier on, um, it's kind of every new um, new definition, new goals for the taxonomy are coming. Uh, the CSRD reporting uh, directive has just been released and new um, standards are being released. So it's really an ongoing process. We only started, but um, the goals are clear um, and they're ambitious it's um reducing the carbon footprint by 20 percent it's um, um increasing the new renewable energy um use the proportion by 20 percent and it's also becoming more energy efficient so this is also the spirit in which all activities are being seen cool okay let's pick three elements from it for today uh because as we said one in progress it's sometimes very technical and detailed uh, but we want to show three highlights. But first of all, okay, uh, but what does that have to do with suppliers of home decoration, home textiles from Indonesia anyway? Um, I ask you, in Bahasa. We're not even in the EU, all right? Sorry for shouting. So good question, people. What does it actually have to do with you? And this is all EU stuff. Does it even like, is it even relevant for you? How can we... How can we answer that one? Maybe Remco. Well, I mean, it's very simple. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you all are all exporters, or you want to become exporters, so you have to deal with the EU. And if you want to export your goods into the EU, you have to comply. It's as simple as that. Cool. Yeah. So what Christina said before, you are part of our of our chain, eh? of our value chain, yes. and so if you want to continue to be part of it. It's also in your interest to um, to help us uh, become climate neutral, just quite apart from the fact that we all need this um, climate change eh? worldwide. We're all part of one world anyway. So, and business has a responsibility as part of that. That's the thinking. Eh? So you're also part of the world. So let's do the first highlights uh, in this Green Deal um, uh, program. It's about sustainability reporting. Uh, I'm highlighting two initiatives here. Um, Christina, could you spend a minute explaining both sure. those initiatives? Mm -hmm. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSRD, as I mentioned, is really um, um, putting the non-financial reporting on the same level as the financial reporting. So companies now have to report. Before, it was more voluntary. I could choose what I disclose, or I could pick the schemes, and now, more companies are required in the first run it's 50,000 i think only in europe but then year by year all the smaller ones have to re report as well and 
Um, we said just right now, okay, as mentioned with the supply chain, even if you're not directly affected, the bigger your customers, et cetera, might need to record in my request you to provide some information. So it's really um, increasing transparency and information along the supply chain. Okay, soon, soon law. Huh? It's already like close to law anyway for Europe and it will and affect you. Exactly. And the CFDD is looking at the supply chain and now putting also more social aspects into it. So um, it defines requirements for a responsible management of the supply chain and really uh, considering human right due diligence aspects. So it's really linking human rights to sustainability. That's the key message there as well. Cool. A few trends here. Uh, this is also still in development, but really coming to you soon. Um, so the trends in this kind of uh, reporting is one, we see increasingly environmental plus social and governance issue popping up. Eh? So uh, not just we're not just focusing on the planet, we're also focusing on the social side of you as a business. And then governance means how do I run my business, uh, a business conduct. So those are the trends that increasingly we're looking at all the three P's, eh? people, profit and planet when it comes to business. The second is that it's now all voluntary uh, and it still will be for a number of years uh, in some cases. Some laws might come sooner than others, uh, but it will definitely become must do for all of us. Um, so now it's relaxed, but it will not be relaxed forever. Okay. And then also what's the whole uh, trend in this uh, program, the Green Deal program, is it starts with the larger companies in Europe and it will trickle down to the smaller ones before you know it. Okay, so larger companies are starting uh, and then the smaller ones have to follow suit very soon. So what's the consequence of the sustainability reporting? One, you have to go deeper into your supply chain. You also, eh? us as well here in Europe as businesses, but you are part of our supply chain. So that means that we are going to ask you to also go deeper into your chain, to know more and get the required information on the table. The second is there will be measuring tools offered uh, that are uh, confirming what you are doing. Uh, and one of the tools, um, uh, those tools are partly also based on certifications that we already have. Uh, so that's again why we said before, it will be really helpful for you to start, already start with a certification that is quite going into your supply chain. So that means you don't get the shock uh, so much when this whole green deal is in action because eh? then you're already used to measuring your supply chain and then finally you have to present your data and you have to present your actions because nobody's perfect and uh you will definitely be asked okay how are you going to close the gap between what you're doing now in social and environmental and where you want to be for the eu eh? so you're going to present actions so that's a good point. Just the last one. You don't have to meet everything at the very beginning. You have to take measures and you have to start. So don't be shocked to say, oh, there's so much I have to comply with. Get informed, start, implement processes and deal with it and communicate it. So maybe that's also a key message. Exactly. Yeah, and in that sense, it's very comparable to a lot of certifications eh, where you have all kinds of stages in which you can find yourself and they keep monitoring your progress. Exactly. So better get used to it already uh, on a voluntary basis, because uh, the reality of life is that yeah, those companies who are leading and most modern and most connecting, they will actually win. So be a modern company. So why does sustainability reporting matter? We have, how much is it? Seven, seven okay. reasons to tell you why. Christina and it Remco, can you take us through this? Sure, it's like a legal requirement, so it's a must do. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be law soon. Mm -hmm. Second one, insight. Providing you transparent information, so you have to disclose, and that's why transparency is key. We see that in, if it's an eco label, the process, etc. It's now about transparency. Exactly, and it gives you insight yourself eh, into how you run your business. Yes, actually, eh? what is my impact? How many people are actually getting meaningful work and income? Uh, how much are they taking home? Um, what are my environmental impacts? You don't know now, most of the time, but if you start reporting the, and using the measuring tool, you also know more about yourself. Eh? So it's also telling for yourself. And then the storytelling. 
it's, well, it's a communication tool, eh? basically. Remco? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it adds to your credibility. And like we already said, uh, the good thing is the moment you have things in place and you are certified or you are complying with certain rules and regulations, uh, it's very easy for your stakeholder dialogue. Exactly. So, yeah, you can do really true storytelling, eh? but now based on real facts. Uh, so if you want to make the statement, my products are biodegradable, then you can now actually prove that they are, and that's a lovely story. Inspiration? Um, awareness raising, really. Um, it's not, um, Remco just mentioned the stakeholders, not just my perspective I'm looking, it's about engaging stakeholders, looking inside out, outside in, and um, yeah, raise awareness and inspire. Yeah, and think about this new consumer huh, popping up. They really want this So uh, most of the time. So how inspiring will it be uh, for them to hear your stories based on true facts? Yeah, so it's, it's going to have a new vibe in the, in the value chain. Huh? We often think about these things as must do and risk and like negative stuff, but it's also positive stuff. It's like I can now really tell a fantastic story based on true facts about what I'm doing huh? and I'm still telling my own story. So differentiation is about being different from your competitors. Eh? So if your story is very convincing and inspiring based on true facts, then you'll definitely be a preferential supplier to many EU, EU importers. Uh, the other day when I was talking to uh, uh, an importer, he also said, yeah, no, uh, I'm going to soon look for suppliers who are already ahead of the game, eh? uh, who can help me uh, and therefore you can be the preferred choice of importers when you got your house in order there. Okay, then strategic planning, if you know what to do uh, and uh, you still know your gaps uh, and your improvements, then you have an action plan uh, and you can only put the actions there in place. So this is not normal part of your um, planning cycle. Eh? So there's lots of uh, positives we'd like to say about becoming more um, uh, becoming uh, better in your sustainability reporting. Seven reasons. Okay. Think about um, it. Yep. It's already 11.30 here in Europe, so we need yep. to move towards wrapping up. Cool. Okay. I'm going to talk very, very now. Here we go. So modern businesses, they, they just do this. Okay. Then we have the circular economy action plan. Uh, this is actually um, touching upon wood. So that's why we just want to quickly mention it. Uh, the vision is that if we want to achieve climate neutrality in 2050, it should be, I think, then circularity is part of, um, of, the, of the solutions we're looking at. What is circularity, um, Christina? It's really moving away from this linear to a closed loop kind of how you make, use, recycle and keep, and if we translate that to what keeps the wood in the loop in a way encourage less waste, less resource consumption, and move towards a circular economy. Cool. A label we, or a term we often hear using in this respect is eco-design. Uh, what is eco-design and how can the Indonesian apply it? So um, it's um, looking not, um, so it's also a regulation kind of setting the standards, looking at the life cycle from resource consumption, manufacture, use phase, end of life, and um, it's looking like it started from energy efficiency aspects, but now considering um, recyclability, recycled content, et cetera. So really the design, how has been a product um, designed to be more sustainable and then to contribute in the big picture to those uh, CO2 reduction green deal goals. Exactly. So you, you, you're used to designing from uh, design and price. But now you're going to also design from, okay, how can I dispose of my product at the end of this cycle and introduce a new cycle? Eh? So you're going to think more circular. How can the product more durable in the market? Uh, and how can I design a product that uh, saves me on transport footprint? So you're going to now also think sustainable circularity and incorporate it in your design process. And sustainable. Um, products are to become the new normal. So that's also the key message. It's not a nice to have luxury product. No, you mentioned that the new consumers, sustainable products should become the new norm. Cool. Okay. So now wood is under uh, investigation. Again, the Indonesian government is taking a very active uh, part in this discussion. 
uh, but for now it's mostly wood for timber and construction okay because those are the high risk areas in terms of all of this so um, it's not about wooden furniture yet uh, it's more about timber and uh, wood as a commodity eh? um, so but that already tells you that wood is one of the product groups that they are thinking of and that might soon trickle down to products made from wood okay so in circular economy action plan talk to your government and say what are you talking about um, with the EU can you in, um, can you um, tell us a little bit more Okay, let's move on to the final one uh, for time's sake. This is the Green Claims Directive. What does it mean? It means um, from now on you cannot make green claims anymore without hard evidence. Okay, um, Christina. So we heard earlier on greenwashing, it could be intentionally or like with purpose or not without purpose, just stating something about the environmental. Um, performance of your products, natural, biodegradable, environmentally friendly, etc. And now you need to have a proof. So you can just claim it, you need to have evidence tested or get your claim verified. So we don't have greenwashing. I mean, we saw in the past there um, were misleading, in, in, misleading information. And I think um, a European study showed that 50% or so of the environmental claims were too vague and wrong. And not necessarily purposely, but it's really giving that direction. We need to be more accurate and reliable and um, be more responsible for our products. Um, and so that's the key message of the screen claims. Take care or pay attention on what you're claiming and saying. Have proof for it and get it externally verified to also avoid that information label jungle confusion. Exactly. exactly. So you can no more... Uh, soon no more make statements about sustainability without actual evidence because um, then you will be against the law. Okay, so there will be criteria for I mean, uh, environmental claims and labels. Uh, so there will be a set of um, indications um, to sort of state your claims on. Uh, so we, we will have criteria for that. And then finally, it will be externally checked. So you can say I've checked and my uh, my statements are true, but there will be external verification needed. So auditors or people um, without any direct link to your business confirming what you're saying yeah, and making your claims. What does this mean for you? It has very practical uh, implications for your business. Okay, one, you have to review and audit all your marketing materials because right now all of you uh, are making sustainable St um, statements about sustainability of your products so soon when this clean claims directive will be in action uh, then you have to go through all your marketing materials and your communication materials and check if you are uh, actually able to make your prove your claim so that's a review of your materials then you have to create evidence for what you are claiming and that means also you have to have better admin systems to store all your data. And then finally, train your staff, understanding all this and also communicating in the proper way. Yeah? So it will have implications for all of you um, uh, as a business. Okay, work to be done. Uh, what are we saying, Christina, in terms of um, when will this be on the table, the Green Claims Directive? When do you think it will be law, roughly? Mm, there's still one or two years to go. They kind of announced it last year. There's some, they're now working on the details. So it will. it's on the horizon, but not yet further cool. defined. Cool. Okay. All right. So again, it will be for EU businesses, EU importers. But because you are part of this value chain, it also means they cannot just accept your messaging anymore you also have to create the evidence also on their behalf okay? so we're all part of this chain and it will affect you as well okay third takeaways here we go the gojek guy so let's make the world a better place uh one is supply chain management and communication uh is something you really need to improve in your in your business because as you see all these laws related to the green law, all these ideas uh, and directives, they all boil down to going into your 
your value chain, your supply chain, and also communicating uh, more accurately what you're doing. Yeah, so all of you now have to look inside your value chain and see what am I doing and am I, am I doing the right thing? So also uh, what's happening in the world is it's going from trust me, I trust you, uh, to really show me. Eh? I need to see the underlying evidence, especially this new generation of millennials and after this, the Gen Z generation who will soon be the professional buyers. They just come from this. They don't just trust you. They want you to show the evidence. So keep that in mind. And then also all of us, all of this that we are um, talking about mostly is related to just being a modern business, having quality norms, quality systems, admin systems, maybe uh, going for a certification. This is all what modern businesses lead, uh, do. Eh? And what we're already seeing in the EU, uh, and especially Christine and me who are in the ethical style guide, we see all these big brands uh, in the trade fairs. And uh, we see the most innovative and most, um, I think, exciting businesses already in the lead. They don't wait for this uh, stuff to become law. They already are preparing. And you should be part of that as well. So pick your, pick your things here from uh, today and um, see what you can already do. And in a minute, we will give you the final tips for what you can do. So it's also being part of modern business. Any questions on this segment before we summarize? Is anything in the chat box that uh, anybody wants to raise? Before no, I, I, have, I have three questions, but they're not specifically on this segment of the presentation. Okay, should we answer them now or um, do this while I do the summary? Let's, let's, let's complete the summary first and then we can go to the questions. Okay, fine with that. Okay, let me just summarize for you. Yeah, so we. We started with legal requirements. Okay, the main takeaway for this was, if you don't know your regulations, there's an access to market online tool for you. Okay, and we showed you a few examples of it. So know your legal requirements. There's no reason not to know them. You can check the system or you can ask around you. So know it. How can I know, ask? Okay, the online tool is there. And there's many people around you, like the ministries who are involved in lots of these talks. Uh, you have your associations, like the Furniture Association, and they should become aware uh, of this too. Huh? So how can I know? Ask. Don't sit still and just wait for things to happen. Uh, don't sit on the fence. Be active and make sure you know. Modern businesses connect. And then finally, practice good housekeeping. So have an internal uh, procedure that checks all these boxes and make sure you don't miss out on anything. So this is where you could even start after this um, session with your coaches to say, do I have a good housekeeping system? And what do I have to do to actually um, make sure I follow this procedure? Okay. That's as far as legal requirements is concerned. Relevant certifications. Uh, we saw there's only one FSC specifically for wood, but there's lots of general ones. We advise you to overachieve on your legal um, commitment, your legal um, requirements, and go for any of these certifications. It will teach you how to go into your value chain. It will also help you in communication. So we would say one of your follow-up issues could be after this, to sit with your coaches and study yourself, um, find some of these um, um, certifications and choose the one that suits you best. So I really advise you to become certified sh uh, shortly. Finally, Green Deal. We said it's still in progress, but it's definitely coming. Okay. So the main two highlights here are that you need to go deeper into your value chain, uh, use measuring tools, uh, and then use it in your communication and actions. So. It's going to be a very um, um, uh, it, it, it's going to be a very active program that you're going to uh, embrace if you want to be part of this green deal um, approach. Do it. Then finally, it will also now affect 
uh, the green claim, claim uh, green deal will also affect what you communicate and how you communicate so follow this and see if you can already improve here eh? or even though now you maybe you have stories that you cannot uh, prove to the point but you can still have your stories and measure your impact eh? how many people are working for me what is their general income you can interview your people and say how what's your life situation so you can already start to measure on a simple level to know more and also to have a story that is underpinned by the first bits of evidence anyway. Eh? So start, don't wait for this thing to happen. Because um, again, those companies who are um, taking initiative and are proactive, uh, they will definitely win. Finally, follow us on the CBI market intelligence platform, uh, which very nice for you. It's gratis, gratis for all of Indonesians. And Remco and me are very much involved in writing uh, all this information uh, for you for the market intelligence when it comes to home decoration. So follow us and um, yeah, and, um, and and try to implement some of this in your business. Remco, do you want to take the floor to get some yes. of the final questions answered? I got three relatively short questions, which I think we can do rather quickly. Eduard, we still have time for that? Um, let's go for uh, three last minutes. Okay, perfect. I'll do it very, very quickly. We have three questions from Nevi, David and Elizabeth. Uh, Nevi wants to know, and I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but he asks, are there any limitations in copying, especially in sizing? Now, it's very <laughs> simple. Um, to avoid being charged with illegal copying, the, the rule of thumb is there must be at least be seven distinct differences between your product and the, uh, the product your product resembles. And so that's the only answer I can give. Um, as an advice, I can say, try to stay away from it. Uh, it's not going to bring you much. It's not going to um, portray you as an original company. So just don't even go there. Avoid the gray areas. Second question. Um, Elizabeth wanted to know, uh, they were approached at Ambiente by a client who wanted to know if their Rotan was certified. We already got this question, but I do remember that case, you and I know this person, there is yeah. one company in the world who managed to uh, certify the complete supply chain of Rotan, and that's actually a Dutch company, Van der Sar, and they succeeded where even IKEA failed, I think. So when it comes to the specific certification of the Rotan supply chain, I think they are the only ones, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so here the tip would be uh, look at the certifications, the general certification that we showed you, pick one that really goes into your supply chain. Because what this buyer did was actually um, map out the whole supply chain. So he knows everything from uh, from the growing, the cultivating of the rattan in West Kalimantan or where, wherever it comes from, down to his factory uh, somewhere in the heart of uh, Java. So find a certification that actually plots out your whole supply chain, then that is what he's also doing. Yes, and then the last question, thanks for that case, uh, that's David's question. Do we have to issue certification for recycled paper or recycled cardboard? Uh, if so, how? Would you know that, Christina? Uh, once again with the cardboard? Um, he wants to know uh, if it's mandatory to have certification for either recycled paper or recycled cardboard and um, there needs to be there is um with the U european packaging directive there are certain amounts where you have to prove how the percentage of recycled content and then you have to um have some documentation proving that it comes from a recycled source so, so my question it Sorry. leads into a certification in a way. There's not the one specific one, but there, there needs to be documentation and proof for that. So there is some um, disclosure aspects. Yeah, and the system now that we showed you today is uh, if you do paper-based uh, packaging, find the right S HS code first, uh, yeah. and then um, find the specific requirements. Then you'll, you'll know what to do. Okay, so this That's could be homework for you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us to the ends of the questions. Um, which We're handing it back to the coaches. Yeah. yeah thanks. Thank you so, very much, Emko, Case, and Christina.
Uh, that was a, a very uh, learnful presentation. Huh? I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, this session will not only be useful for uh, future Indonesian uh, exporters to the European market, but also for more experienced companies looking for concrete updates. Um, for the audience regarding the, the questions uh, um, of the questions box that were not treated, uh, keep in mind that Case and Remco will be able to have a look at them and uh, they will be able to come back to you with answers. Um, please keep in mind also that uh, the webinar will be added to our uh, website shortly and uh, a PDF version of the presentation will be sent to all the attendees of this session. So it's now um, 11.51 Central European time. It's now time for me to uh, end the session by taking again our speakers, Remco, Case and Christina, and also our partners from uh, the Indonesian Ministry of Trade. And last but not least, uh, a special thank to the coaches, Elizabeth, Natalia and uh, Soli Levy, who uh, helped us to identify your needs as a preparation to this webinar. See you soon on our website for more inside information about home decoration. Stay up to date about uh, our projects with uh, our newsletter. And uh, we wish you a, a very nice day.